to our Monday study and practice session where we where we uh, today are going to begin our study of um, Stephen Goodman's The Buddhist Psychology of Awakening. And uh, I think everybody here is aware that Stephen died just um, two weeks ago, really, to the day, very sadly. And um, yeah, there was this was actually this was already in the works since quite some time. Um, so it's sort of um, yeah, it's sort of bittersweet that we are undertaking this this study um, at this point. But anyway, uh, at the same time, it really also is then um, a celebration and um, yeah, an honoring of uh, Stephen. Uh, who I consider a very good, learned, and very good practitioner. Uh, someone who really um, unreservedly engaged in the study and practice of Buddhism for a very long time. So, um, and really one of the pioneers in the field. One thing, of course, is that, that um, Buddhism has been an academic s subject for a very long time uh, in the Western context, but to have academics that actually were willing to go and experience it uh, has been has is only a recent phenomenon. And uh, Stephen was one of the early generation of these pioneers that courageously actually not just holding the subject matter at a sort of safe distance and objectifying it, uh, but really actually testing testing it and uh, experiencing it. Um, it's a bit like uh, sometimes in academia, you have the idea that, oh, you, you shouldn't get too close to the subject matter because um, then you lose your uh, objectivity. It's a bit like saying like you can't, uh, you can't teach poetry or Shakespeare uh, if you have actually experienced all the emotions of these poems, say love or despair. If you've experienced love and despair, you're not qualified to um, teach, you know, um, Yeats, Shelley, Shakespeare, whatever, because uh, you don't have an objective relationship to it. That's sort of the, <laughs> sort of the paradox of this sort of um, claim to objectivity as if such a thing even existed. Anyway, the, um, the greatness of Stephen lies in someone who really, um, not only studied, not only experienced it, but also was able to communicate this. And this is, of course, why I thought it would be really great in the context of us studying Abhidharma to um, study his work. And uh, I decided to study his work actually before I even read it. I just um, felt confident that it would be really um, quality. And now I've been reading it, really, it is. So I'm very pleased that we're undertaking this study. Um, <clears throat> so, hold on, I'm just gonna tell my phone to be quiet. And, um, and so yes, um, so we're going to begin doing that. Um, one of the really nice things about Stephen's work is that it takes a subject which traditionally is sort of regarded as a little bit daunting and um, makes it very uh, palatable, very accessible. Abhidharma is about what's going on in our mind. So it's very much for practitioners. If you're engaging in Buddhism just because, you know, you, you like the lamas and, you know, you like the Tibetans and it's all beautiful and groovy and like that, uh, then, <clears throat> then um, of course, the Abhidharma is seen as very dry and terse and so forth. But if you're actually a practitioner of meditation and you're continually working with what's going on in, in the mind, um, then you need something that is um, quite clear, not just vague about the mind, but quite clear and to actually understand the um, exact goings-ons uh, in the mind it's very helpful to be able to navigate this and have a handle on it through uh, an awareness of, of um, the 
phenomena of the mind, the mental factors, and that is very much the subject of, of the Abhidharma. Um, of course, you could say, well, ultimately, Buddhism is, or the objective of Dharma is to go beyond, uh, beyond the, uh, the ordinary workings of the mind and into something uh, that is beyond the mind. Yeah, to some extent, but that's, that's really the, the, um, the scope of the very most subtle aspect of meditation. And f certainly out of meditation, then the ordinary experiences of the mind and what happens with the mind uh, is very real for us. And, so, and also really for us to understand the pith of meditation and understanding the pith of the view, then it's, it's essential that we understand the the conditioned nature of the mind and understand how mind is not really just one unitary thing but it's made it's really a coming together of a lot of different conditions that we refer to as the dependent arising of our experience so um so this study is very very valuable um if we're actually engaged in the practice of the path and Again, we're very, very grateful to Stephen to have them. And Stephen's background then is that he he was, we look at this, we'll look at his forward. And I th I'm just going to, essentially what we're going to do is just read this book together. And every time, once in a while, when I think it's, it's appropriate, I might sort of unpack a few things or comment on a few things. And you, of course, are welcome at any given point to uh, question. That's the... The format here lends itself to it. You can just type in questions and uh, I'll be notified when you have questions. So feel free to do that. So we're basically just going to be reading through it. But um, just to initially sort of just let you know, Stephen taught this over for some 20 years, really, in, in different contexts. So I had a lot of experience of presenting this material um, in, a, in a modern context. Okay. Okay, preface. A few words about the focus and origin of this book may help to orient the reader. First, the focus. For whom was it written? It was written primarily for those who have or might develop an interest in the very basic Buddhist teachings associated with what Tibetan traditions call the first turning of the wheel of the Dharma. Here, there are group teachings on proper conduct, the Vinaya, Discourse, Sutra, and commentaries, Shastra, and the basic teachings that came to be gathered under the rubric of Haya Dharma Abhidharma. Okay, so the first turning of the wheel is traditionally um, the Four Noble Truths, the law of karma and essentially understanding the role of the mind and the mind the role of the mind in shaping our experiences and but basically also understanding how phenomena exist on the basis of causes and conditions in the sense of where does our suffering come from and also working with the elimination of suffering and when we talk about then the buddha's um, teachings we talk about typically what we call the tripitaka or the three baskets, which are then the teachings on, like Stephen says here, proper conduct, the discourses, and then the Abhidharma. And then you also have the commentaries, which are then from later masters, the Shastras, who then would uh, unpack the, the teachings. But specifically then what we're looking at here, then the higher Dharma, Abhidharma, Stephen continues the teachings on higher Dharma, are, for the most part, rather technical, consisting of main points and enumerated lists of basic factors, dharmas, of phenomena mentioned in the sutras. There is a rich codification of such teachings preserved in the early Pali Buddhist traditions and thereafter in the Theravadan Abhidharma literature. In addition, there is a different set of texts used by the living traditions associated with Indo-Tibetan Buddhist lineages, which is the focus of this book. These have been largely preserved in Sanskrit, as well as in translation in Tibetan, Chinese, and Mongolian languages. Primary among these texts is the treasury of higher Dharma, the Abhidharma Kosha, by the 5th century Indian Buddhist savant Vashubandhu. 
My love of the Abhidharma was cat catalyzed by Emeritus Professor Jaini, University of California at Berkeley, who stressed that a thorough knowledge of the Abhidharma tradition should be the bedrock and starting point for all Buddhist studies. So, yeah, let me just say that as far as the Abhidharma goes, then it's something which is taught widely then in all the uh, Buddhist traditions, and specifically then Vashubandhu's uh, Abhidharma Kosha is something that is regarded as really uh, an essential text. And so you have, actually recently we have a commentary on it by somebody called Chim Jampian that's translated into to, uh, English. I think Stephen will be mentioning this. Um, and with, within the Tibetan colleges, then the Abhidharma Kosha is studied and particularly then the um, the, uh, the text that comment on this is studied, but regarded as something that is um, sort of very detailed in terms of understanding then the workings of the mind. Um, so Stephen continues, I hope that some glimmers of insight and humor in spite of flaws in my understanding may dawn in the minds of readers. Perhaps more importantly, I have also been inspired by the living tradition of Buddhist study and practice. And it is to that tradition and those lineages that I pay homage and gratitude. Scholars and those who are well versed in the original source materials may find this approach to cavalier. This book, therefore, is not aimed at the specialists who can read the original text themselves. Rather, it is aimed at inviting a fresh look at this noble tradition. It is for those who might seek to refresh their view on Buddhist basics and then perhaps to actually apply that view in their practice. The challenge is to find a way to present the main points of this rather encyclopedic compendium that might inspire and guide the curious modern reader into the profundity and nuances of an Abhidharma approach to the view and practice of the Buddha Dharma. I've chosen to give an account based on the compendium itself and the Tibetan commentaries and summaries based upon it that strives to bring out a lively, relevant, and what might be considered a somewhat novel way to actually apply some of the key approaches of the higher Dharma for a contemporary non-specialist readership. So this is actually rather refreshing because I think it's not that many of us who have actually the background to engage in all the, the detailed and very precise language that's associated with the traditional study of uh, Abhidharma. And of course, what we'd want to do is really have something that is has relevance for our experience and our practice. So many of us fall into the category of, of uh, non-specialists, but at the same time, um, along with being a non-specialist, even more actually probably most likely a practitioner. So that's a pretty good place to be really. So we should we should have this uh, intention with this study that it's something we apply in our practice. One might ask, Stephen continues then, how the technical language of a fifth century tradition on the Buddha Dharma can provide something relevant for modern times. I have tested and refined the material in this book and have placed a primary emphasis on using conversational, casual and non-technical language in order to show using everyday examples how some of the central insights of Abhidharma might still be accessible and useful to those who approach the study and practice of the Buddha Dharma in contemporary times. Of course there will be errors of fact but hopefully the spirit of inquiry is faithful to Vashubandhu and his heirs. The reader will note that will note that I refer here and there to Tibetan Buddhist teachers and make certain points. I do this in part because these teachings are vibrant and thriving in the living lineages that they transmit. And I myself continue to be inspired by such examples. So also this presentation will reflect the fact that Stephen was part of the living tradition of Buddhism as it emerged in what we could call a, an American Buddhism, even though Stephen wasn't at all. Uh, one of the sort of upholders of this sort of, uh, you know, um, notion of a, a unique American Buddhism, particularly, but but was very much um, someone who studied with the 
the lamas who first came to America, Tatang Tupu, Shigam Trungpa Rinpoche, and then also um, Dunjan Rinpoche, Chinli Noble Rinpoche, Songsa Kenzo Rinpoche, and so on. So he very much is part of it, you could say, the living community that most of us also are familiar with and part of. So the origins of this book, many years ago at the newly established Nyingma Institute in Berkeley, California, the head Tibetan Buddhist teacher, Tatang Tuku, urged me to begin an intensive study of what was then available of Abhidharma literature in European languages. To that end, I prepared a rough translation from the French of the Abhidharma section of Etienne Lamotte's L'Histoire du Bouddhisme Indien, which is now available in English translation. I, I, then I delved into a study of Louis de la Vallée Poussin's French translation of Vasubandhu's Kosha, entitled L'Abhidharma Kosha, now also available in English translation by Pruden, 1991. This background work was soon supplemented by a study of the Tibetan translations of Vasubandhu's work, works written in Tibetan as commentaries on the Kosha and works written by Indian commentators. Finally, I was led to study and translate key portions of Jum Mipam Rinpoche's Gateway to Knowledge and the commentary on it by Katok Kimbo Nudin. This text by Mipam is now also available in English in full, translated by Eric Pema So many of you are familiar with Eric Pema um, translations, and so the title in English uh, is then Gateway to Knowledge. You can find that. What I called from these studies was a desire to present key points of view to eager graduate students at the Graduate, graduate Theological Union in Berkeley via its affiliation with the newly established Nyingma Institute. These students were bright and engaged and asked many questions about the diverse categories of dharmas and their arrangement into conditioned and unconditioned. They also asked what any of this had to do with the foundational teachings of the Buddha Dharma, such as the Four Noble Truths, meaning suffering, the causes of suffering, the cessation of suffering, and the paths leading to the cessation of suffering. From the very beginning, beginning beginnings of teaching this material, we explore the possible implications for what emerged as what we might call a special kind of Buddhist psychology, and how such study might inspire and provoke a new way forward into foundational and transformational practices. And this, of course, reflects the dialogue that happened very early on in the, you could say, living tra transmission of Buddhism, which then took place in the late 60s, early 70s, and continues to this day, which is about the mind, not and the mind understood not in a metaphysical or abstract religious sense, but very much in terms of the phenomenology of experience, what we're going through. And that's where psychology and Buddhism have a lot in common in, in terms of operating within an empirical, if you like, um, approach of what is actually felt and experienced. So that's where, that's where they're, um, and also there in the, in the work of Tatang Tuku actually, um, there was very much an atmosphere. There was uh, Herbert Günther and, and Leslie Kawamura, who in the 70s published a book that's called uh, Mind in Buddhist Psychology, which was also about Abhidharma. Then we have the Gateway of Knowledge, which is more traditional and more terse. Um, and then also we've had Tata Tuba's own teachings on this, which is called the, oh, I forget, the Ways of Enlightenment, I think it's called, also on the Abhidharma. Um, anyway, so Stephen continues, sometime after those initial presentations, I was invited to explore these approaches at the Naropa Institute, uh, now Naropa University in Boulder, Colorado, to a lively and engaged group of Buddhist students. In subsequent years and through many refinements, this material was taught in courses at the California Institute of Inter Integral Studies in S San Francisco and at a summer study program at the Rigpa Shedra in southern France. Thus, what you have before you is a reworked and edited presentation of these lectures and teaching materials that are based on the Indo-Tibetan textual traditions of Abhidharma. I hope some of these novel approaches may prove to be beneficial in presenting a coherent introduction to the depth and precision of Abhidharma methods to this, 
um, to the study of Buddha Dharma. Finally, I hope that the light and conversational tone of this book will be inviting to all. So acknowledgements. I'm going to read this because this also reflects, you say, the authentic teachers that, that Stephen studied with. He says, I must acknowledge those teachers who first encouraged me to undergo the study and exploration of the Abhidharma, Tata and Tupu, from Nyingma Institute, Chigam Trumpa Rinpoche from the Europa Institute, Professor Jaini, University of California, Berkeley, and Professor Herbert Günther, University of Saskatchewan. Without their encouragement and goading, I would not have ventured into these wild forests of study. Secondly, I must thank both to Wutundrup and Daniel Goldman for reviewing this work when it was still in manuscript form. Their encouragement and kind words are greatly appreciated. Finally, I must thank both Snowline and Nausha Bala Publications for accepting this book for pu uh, publication. And thank you to my first editor, Dave O'Neill, and my final editor, Casey Kemp, for their attention to form and content. Finally, thanks are due to the editorial skills of Leah Sample for her work on the notes and many other details. To all the students, colleagues, and recorders of transcripts and transcribers of various versions of this material over the years, I give thanks and trust that your efforts to bring this study to light will be met with approval. May those in the future who chance upon this study at least be inspired to inquire more deeply into the rich traditions of Buddha Dharma. So this is then, this is then um, the aspiration. So actually this constitutes, I'm sure Stephen would not mind me <laughs> sort of extrapolating a bit here, but this actually constitutes what you traditionally have in a, in a text, which is actually paying homage to the teacher, the Buddhas or your own teachers, and um, actually committing, committing to um, completing the work with, uh, you could say, an aspiration that it might benefit. So we actually have that here then. Okay, introduction. So this is actually a, one we should remember if anybody asks you, what are you doing with your this Buddhism business, then there's a very slick, although probably not exactly comprehensive for most people, but nevertheless, we can remember this. In a phrase, all of the teachings of the Buddha might be seen as, a conc as concrete methods to go from dukkha to sukha. We'll see what, how these are defined, but essentially we are talking about suffering, to go from suffering, the condition of samsara, to sukha, beyond suffering, the condition of nirvana. So, so we're going from dukkha to sukha. That's what we're doing here. Yeah. Okay, this book presents an approach to Buddhist psychology that tries to make practical sense of some of the core teachings and approaches of the higher Dharma, Abhidharma, according to the Indo-Tibetan Buddhist tradition. It primarily focuses on the fifth century classic entitled Treasury of Higher Dharma, Abhidharma Kosha, by the famed Indian uh, Buddhist scholar, Vasubandhu, and on subsequent works written by masters in the Indo-Tibetan tradition. The importance of the treasure of higher Dharma continues even in the, these present times as witnessed in Ian James Coghlan's recent translation of the commentary by Chim Jampiya, who is credited with composing the first commentary written by a native Tibetan scholar. So you can see this under references. And this is then a work which is studied all across the, the different um, the different traditions, the different shidras. The treasury of higher dharma, the Abhidharma Kosha, is based on the tradition of reflection on the legacy of the Buddha's discourses, the sutras, that were orally transmitted and studied in and around what was historically known as Gandhara in northwest India. This actually, um, this in this day and age, this extends into uh, Pakistan. Uh, right up to um, Afghanistan, uh, where you have, um, to this day, you have Buddhist, uh, Buddhist uh, um, stupas, monasteries, and also the first Buddhist monastery is actually in a place called Taxila, which is only a few hours drive 
outside of Islamabad in Pakistan. So this is what we know as Gandhara. And it's also from there that we have all these beautiful, uh, what we call Indo, uh, in, uh, Indo-Greco uh, sculptures, you know, these very beautiful Greek looking representations of Buddhas and Bodhisattvas. So, so this is where then there was a, a, a tradition of um, where, where then uh, Vashubandhu taught. Based on the encyclopedic text known as the great uh, compendium, the Mahavibhasha, which today only survives in Chinese translation, Vashubandhu, according to tradition, would lecture on one topic for a day and at the conclusion, compose a four line verse summarizing that lecture in a very concise form. This was done mostly to serve as a mnemonic device for later study. He composed almost 500 such verses and wrote a commentary on them known as the Commentary to the Treasury of ha Haya Dharma, Abhidharma Kosha Baisha, which consists of eight chapters through a ninth, though a ninth chapter on the nature of self, Putgala was later added. Those eight primary chapters embody a vast range of erudition with detailed discussions about the nature of the person and their world, karma, emotional impediments, and meditative states. The technical terms and definitions embodied in Vashubandhu's auto commentary have served as the primary material for almost all subsequent musings on the higher meaning of the Buddha's discourses and ethical guidance. There were subsequent commentaries on Vashubandhu's treasury written in Sanskrit and translated into Tibetan as well as original Tibetan commentaries, which are studied to this day in the context of the Buddhist colleges of higher learning. Yeah. So someone says, uh, can you please explain what Sukha means? Well, Stephen here is sort of just sort of a, coining a very snappy phrase really about what we're doing on the path to enlightenment, which is going from dukkha to sukha. And so dukkha is um, suffering and sukha is essentially the opposite of suffering. But we're going to look more at what suffering or how dukkha can be understood. But essentially um, what we mean with, the, with uh, sukha is then the freedom from suffering. So, so we're going essentially from the condition of samsara to the condition of nirvana. Yeah. So yes, so someone's saying unsatisfactoriness to satisfactoriness. Yes, we can say that. Yes, yes. And then someone comments in Indonesian, sukha means enjoyment. Okay. Thank you. You know, it's interesting with Indonesian, there's so much Sanskrit in Indonesian. Um, and also actually in Thai, it's, it's very sort of, um, yeah, we found a lot of uh, Sanskrit in these languages, yeah? And Dukkha is suffering. I have heard Sukha translated as bliss. Yes, exactly, yeah, bliss. Yeah, Maha Sukha, great bliss, yeah. Okay, great. So from a doctrinal point of view, for those so interested, the treasury lays out the primary tenets of the Sarvastavadin school, considered one of the 18 schools that developed in India several hundred years after the death of Shakyamuni Buddha. This school was foundational for the Tibetan tradition, for the Tibetan tradition's understanding of both rules of conduct and the higher meaning of the sutras. The Sarvastavadin views embodied in the Abhidharma Kosha are not to be confused or conflated with the um, Staviravadin or Theravadin, we have the elders tradition, which are textually based on the Pali Buddhist canon and have their own approach to the higher Dharma, Dharma studies. An outstanding example of which is the path of purification, the Vishuddhimagga by Buddha Gosha. Okay, so this is essentially, you could say as far as the, the foundational ordination lineages go, this is, of course, there were 18 schools that uh, sort of emerged after the Buddha passed. But certainly what um, very vividly present to this present day is the lineage of the Sarvastavadin, which essentially is the, the ordination lineage, the lineage of the Vinaya, the monastic ordination that was brought, that was um, carried on in Tibet. And then you have the ordination lineage of the 
um, the, um, the Stavira Vardens or the Terra Vardens, which you then have in Sri Lanka, Thailand, so forth. So there's both of these traditions uphold the Vinaya, but then as far as their ways of uh, explaining and practicing and so forth, they are then different. And it's very often there where we also find the divide, even though he here, say the Savastavadin and the Theravadin, they both operate from the point of view of the, um, the foundations of Buddhism, the, the Vinaya and the what we call Pratimoksha, the individual liberation. It's on the basis of the Sarvastavadin school that we then have the, the monastic institutions that upheld the Mahayana, whereas the Theravadins more uphold than the, the approach of the non-Mahayana traditions. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so as far as the, the Theravadin tradition goes, this one here, the, the Vishuddhimaga is a, is a great classic and uh, you know, essentially one of the, the most important commentaries that, that we have in the, in the um, Theravadan tradition. So why, why is study? So beginning with the view, um, some traditional Buddhist teachers have said that they observe Western Buddhists to have a sincere heart and a sense of of practice and its importance, but lack a stable view, which comes from study. Perhaps one way to address this lack of a stable view is to encourage Westerners to use their habitual tendencies to make discriminating distinctions in a new way. So of course, this is because what we have in the Western world, and I think everybody would agree, is we have our own particular science that we are very much um, even though we might have, have found it unsatisfactory, uh, it's interesting to, to see how even um, dedicated Buddhists still believe in the materialist science of Western modernity. And to the extent also, or to a large extent, this also now applies to Asian Buddhists, that where more and more there is this embracing of materialist science, which actually doesn't understand consciousness. So that's where the, for the Western Buddhists, they very often have sort of a romantic engagement in the Buddhist path. But as far as sort of deeply, deeply sort of, in, in, you could say, ensconced attitudes, they very often that there's this belief in the materialism, you know, the idea that consciousness emerges from the brain and that kind of stuff. So this, this of course, um, this has a lot to do then with uh, Westerners that that sort of uh, engage in Buddhism, but they don't bring in their own uh, critical thinking. Um, and so the view and the, the, um, the, the perspective that we bring to, to the Buddhist practice is really essential in terms of what we're doing. It is actually what informs our belief system, what informs our notion of truth. So in that way, um, to engage in Buddhism without actually engaging our critical thinking uh, is uh, actually results in a somewhat compartmentalized, somewhat split uh, approach where you have on one hand, you have your Buddhist practice, but then you still have the, the sort of the belief systems that prevail within uh, modernity or within Western, um, in the Western view. So there is this, this um, and this is also basic to the, to the Western approach when you think religion then you think, oh, well, if I'm going to go into religion, I need to switch off my critical thinking. But that's exactly what Buddhism isn't. Buddhism is about engaging your critical thinking. It's about questioning ensconced, deeply held beliefs. And so that's where the view is really essential also to, to, engage, to engage fully in understanding our reality. And at that time also then, uh, it's then your your whole being really is is infused with a determination to do something about the mind, and so the the more there's an understanding of the view, view the more there is a wholehearted engagement in the practice. So, but this is about beginning to expand one's view from a rather confined materialist perspective into one that embraces the uh, the science of 
consciousness, the science of the mind. And that is, of course, what we then have in Buddhism. He, Stephen continues, the Buddhist term often used to talk about this new way of thinking is sometimes translated as the view or right view. This, this starts an eightfold list, the eightfold path that represents the traditional way of explaining how to find oneself on the path to cessation of suffering. So when we talk about the Four Noble Truths, then we have the truth of suffering, the cause, the cessation, and then we have the path to actually do something about it. So when we, but when we engage in the path, we need to actually know what it is that we're doing. So the first thing that we do is generally understand what is, what are we doing here? Just like if we begin to engage in a therapy, we begin to engage in uh, treatment or some uh, addressing some problem, we want to begin to understand what, what exactly is it that's going on here? We assess the situation, you know? Um, so, so that's where we, we um, begin then to um, look at the right view. Stephen continues, the Eightfold Path, Marga, was first elaborated by the Buddha at Sanat when he turned the wheel of the Dharma for the first time. The wheel, the eight, the eight, um, the Eightfold Noble Paths are the right view, Samyak Dishti, the right thought, Samyak Samkalpa, right speech, Samyak Vak, right conduct, Samyak Karmanta, right livelihood, Samyak Ajiva, right effort, samyak vyayama, right mindfulness, samyak smriti, and eight, right concentration, samyak samadhi. Subsequent writings categorize these eight into three categories, which are then, sometimes we refer to these as also the three trainings. And this is first, the training of wisdom that comprises of one and two, which are then right view and right thought. Then, Secondly, and that's also what we refer to sometimes as the training in prajna. And then the second one, conduct, which is then the training in shila, uh, ethical behavior, that comprises then three, four, and five, which are then the right speech, right conduct, and right livelihood. And then meditation, samadhi, which comprises six, seven, and eight, which is then right effort, right mindfulness and right concentration. So this really, if, we're, if we want to understand what is the Buddhist path about, well, about, we could say, okay, what's the Buddhist path about? Let's remember what Stephen was saying. It's to go from dukkha to sukha. Essentially what we're talking about is understanding that our nature is essentially pure but it's gone astray. This we'll also look at. It's essentially, we've gone into a delusional condition, a cognitive dysfunction, but this can be remedied. And so all we're talking about here is really understanding how do we treat this condition? And we treat it through then this eightfold path. That's exactly what we're doing on the path to enlightenment. Um, why does right effort fall under meditation and not conduct? I'll look that up. I, 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 would, um, I, can, I could do some guessing here, but uh, I'd rather look, in, um, I'll look it up properly so you will have it from authoritative source. Um, so could, you, could I ask you to send me that question in an email and I'll bring it up next time. Um, Another translation of Sika or Sukha, Su means good and Ka means whole. In that case, the whole where a chariot wheel and axle come together. In the wheel make in the wheelwright, if the wheelwright and the chariot maker did a good job, the ride was Sukha, and the good fit allowed the wheels and axles to work together smoothly. Thank you. Yeah, we're going to look at that. Uh, this exact image actually is, is going to be used here in explaining uh, sukha. Yeah, and dukkha is when there's, you know, when there's a, uh, when the act, when it's not working so well. Yeah. So, 
So it also means content. Okay. Good. <laughs> Great. Thank you. The path indicates both the destination, that is a place to go, and also the road or way that leads to that destination. If one finds this path and learns how not to deviate from it, or knows how to become aware of the deviation, and then one finds one's way back, this path will lead us to our destination, what Buddhists call liberation, the cessation of all suffering, nirodha or nirvana. Nirvana is a term that has worked its way into the English lexicon, most recently as a name of a popular rock group. In the Eightfold Listing of the Path, view is given the first place in the traditional explanation of how to distinguish between what is path to Nirvana and what is not, between what encourages and sustains us on the path and what um, blocks or mystifies us so that we can't make the distinction. See, this is also where it's so important to actually have to do some study and not just say, okay, I like this method. Because we actually want to know exactly, it's not just about the methods, it's about what's happening within us. And so also when we talk about critical thinking in the Buddhist context, because we usually talk about study, then we talk about reflection, which essentially means critical thinking. It means not only critically thinking about the propositions that are discussed, but it also means critically thinking how this applies to us. And that's where we arrive at an understanding that is related directly to our experience and makes the information entirely relevant to our personal experience. And that's then where we uh, proceed to uh, what we call the wisdom of meditation. So we talk about the wisdom of study, the wisdom of reflection and the wisdom of meditation. And it's this then that gives us the view. And that's where we understand what is it that makes me confused? What is it that actually sets me free? What is it in terms of my actions and what is it in terms of my attitudes that drive suffering and what drives liberation? And that's where the teaching of the Buddha all, all of a sudden becomes incredibly um, relevant and intimately um, understood as something that pertains to our experience. So that's where, um, so that's where we begin to understand what it is that um, blocks us and what it is that sets us free. So that's about the view. Next is the path. Stephen says many people think that the path means something like an already existent road as if someone already did the hard work and all one has to do, do is get his or her legs onto it. And as soon as they're on it, everything will go splendidly. That, that might be uh, sort of the popular idea of signing up in the church. And there you're sort of, you're gonna be, you know, salvation is gonna happen just by you being there. But that's not really the, the case uh, in the Buddhist teaching, annoyingly. Um, it's about a journey. So it's not just that we're on the right track, but we actually have to move. Stephen continues, but perhaps a more accurate translation would be journey. So this is, this is what we refer to as, as marga. In fact, in the Indian Buddhist context, the Sanskrit word for path, marga, is often used with an instrumental grammatical ending, marjena. Um, it is by means of the path that one goes. And by the way, a disclaimer, don't for a minute think that I'm pronouncing authentic Sanskrit here. Um, it's entirely just, um, how do you say, winging it. Um, I'm afraid I haven't studied Sanskrit and not familiar with exactly how it's pronounced. But um, th at the same time, also, we do use a lot of uh, Sanskrit, so not entirely unfamiliar words either. Yeah? Um, then somebody is commenting and says, when, when we do the critical thinking and connect it to our context and apply it to me and my experiences, would that pose a kind of bias of how we do reflections? Yeah, but that's intentional. Um, we definitely want to, to uh, engage in Buddhism as something that we own. 
so that's also where we need to respect also others might do things differently sometimes people they will um, they'll have very different approaches to the same method and the same view of course we need to validate what we adopt and what we um, you could say own in terms of our establishing the view we need to validate that through critical thinking and you could say proper method um, but at the same time it's entirely about us applying it in terms of our own experience uh, follow up here so there's no specific way or largely a view if not too rigid yeah if we're rigid then that's not the intention what what the view is about is about setting us free the one thing that definitely doesn't set us free is to adopt a set of dogmatic sort of beliefs or adopting a new rigid position so yeah the view should really sort of um, make us softer yeah it's also concerned just says to when we begin to understand the view it's a bit like we take a cloth and we dip it in acid and it comes up again we still have the cloth but we just need to sort of go and then the the um the material disperses and similarly also when we begin to uh, understand the view it's something that softens uh, like the acid it softens our rigidity and our dogmatic positions and more than that it also softens the insecurity that drives us to adopt dogma, dogmatic positions. And that's where you can say the middle way and the teachings of the view, they dismantle dogmatic positions, but they also dis dismantle the belief, the rigidity about, around ourself. And that's where we need meditation to really get to the bottom of that. A lot of the, the middle way teachings that refute dogmatic positions that can be understood on the basis of reasoning and intellect and so forth. But to really get to the core of where these, this sort of insecurity and the dualism, the duality of self and other, this and that originates, which is basic ignorance, we need then to practice uh, meditation. And that's what then softens us. So as far as journey goes, this has been interpreted to mean it is a journey and in a process of finding our way by means of intellect and heart out of the thick forest of confusion and pain and into a clearing from which we can first glimpse and then perceive more stably a way of proceeding with a sense of confidence. So this is where when we own the teaching, when we have applied this or rather sort of um, inquired, analyzed, and arrived at our own particular understanding then it makes a lot of sense the teaching makes tremendous sense and then we can proceed um, confidently this is what we refer to as establishing the view with confidence and once we have that then we can we journey ahead without too much which are without too much worry so that's where for us to proceed really um, there has to be this um, this this uh, overview that enables the journey. Dharma is difficult to precisely communicate. Um, this is actually important for us in uh, the modern world because we're surrounded by a community of persons who will believe very differently. So it's not really about us necessarily becoming missionaries or beginning to, um, to proselytize Buddhism, but it's it's just also for our own sake that we can actually be clear on where we stand in relation to some of the, the belief systems that are so uh, prevalent. Um, but of course, this also applied in the old India where people habitually and people everywhere believe in, in you know, they are stuck on appearances, stuck on what they, and sort of perceive on a very superficial level without questioning. So there's a lot of naivete or, or simple-mindedness that drives the ordinary habitual way of seeing things. So Stephen says, now you might ask, what does this path have to do with study? For many people, this question might never arise. For most people, it seems, might never, for most people, it seems, um, might never think of a path or journey out of suffering. They're too absorbed with the stresses of everyday life, right? 
for most people then, this talk about a path might seem rather strange. Talk about the Dharma is not, in many cases, easy to square with our everyday concerns of this life. And this, of course, we can see. It's rare that there's actually people who would think in terms of being on a path. Or they might, they might sort of like to introduce, sort of improvise their own path or uh, sort of follow a path for a while and then follow another path. When the first path is a bit sort of uninteresting, they'll go on to another path. And there's not really a sense of a committed uh, journey from confusion into awakening. So, and, and for an even larger portion of people, then there's simply not any notion of path. You know, you just deal with the ad hoc of, of everyday concerns, right? Stephen continues, that is not to say it is difficult but to use the words of the Buddha himself, the Dharma is profound, easily misinterpreted, and very difficult to precisely communicate so that a particular individual might understand. So this also, I think many who are Buddhists, they know it's not so easy to communicate. Um, it's subtle, and it goes beyond what very often people expect religion would be about. Like Tsongsa Kinsirimbaji said, it would be so much easier to market Buddhism, if we have rules that said you have to, you uh, you can't eat chicken, and you have to do a pilgrimage to this place, you know, and we often see this when people would say, you know, so are you Buddhists, what do you do, you know, and of course Buddhism has not has is has a few you know prescriptions about what to do, but it's mainly about um, penetrating confusion, you know, you ask. <laughs> <laughs> try what do you Buddhists do? Well, we penetrate confusion, you know, you try and come up with that answer. <laughs> so, <laughs> so anyway, um, so that's where the Buddha himself acknowledged the difficulty in this situation. So Stephen continues, this is why the Buddha said that those who are inspired by the sublime Dharma, Sat Dharma, the sublime way of upholding what is most important, would be well advised to learn the habits of precisely communicating in a language and style that is specifically appropriate to the temperaments, cultural backgrounds, and motivations of those who have shown an interest. See, this is where we and we all land there. You know, so many of us land in this situation, sort of late nights, you know, maybe over a few drinks or just sitting high on cappuccinos and whatever, that they're sort of, we delve into deep, meaningful conversations. And that is actually where there is a genuine interest in understanding that which lies beyond appearances. And that's where it's good actually to have then a language that can actually clearly communicate what it is that we're doing in terms of the path. So, so that's, that's why we need to have the language as appropriate to the particular context. Stephen continues, these basic Dharma teachings were never meant for the crowd or the pub, at least not the basic teachings. And then he comments, in time, however, it seems the Buddha Dharma was transmitted in many unusual contexts. These basic teachings are a true and reliable way of learning how to identify and then eliminate sources of pain and suffering. So of course the relevance of these of the teachings um, remain you know universal. So in some ways it shouldn't be impossible to communicate this, but nevertheless we have to particularly stay clear of some of the stereotypification that happens when it comes to spirituality, Buddhism, what is perceived as religion, and anything really that has to do with this um, intangible realm of uh, intimate personal experience. Just wondering if the Buddhist study of logic and debate is something that falls under the Abhidharma basket. I hear the Dalai Lama mentioning quite often about importance of logic and debate study. Yeah, logic and debate applies for everything because essentially logic and debate is what informs the validity of our science. So one thing is that we're informed. Now we're gonna look at, at the mind, right? But you also want to be sure that that the way that you're engaging in this is not based on belief, 
but based on uh, logic. So logic is very basic to this notion of critical thinking. The thing is, when we think critically and when we test something on the basis of logic and debate, you know this when you debate with your friends, you know, of course you could win in your debate with your friend, but that's not really useful. What actually is useful in debate is when both parties arrive at a greater perspective. You begin to understand what the other person is saying and they understand what you're saying and together debate actually brings about a wider perspective. And that's where the questioning process, logic and debate is viewed as very important for us, whatever we're engaging with. And so in, um, in the colleges of Buddhism, you have these continual uh, practices of debating. Actually, you also have it in, in some, you know, in some uh, high schools. In the, in, I know here in Australia, you sometimes in other places in America and in England, you have these debating societies, right? And that is essentially something where you, where you whatever you're studying, you approach it with a critical mind. And um, while some of the debates sometimes become a little bit formalized, for us in the modern world, it's actually very important because um, questioning the, the sort of these ideas and discussing them actually enables us to emerge with a greater understanding. So that's why the Dalai Lama recommends this. Um, mm, 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 mm. So someone says, quite an irony. It's basic teaching. It's basic teaching, but can't be shared with a crowd. Well, that's not it really. It's it's just that very often the crowd, because you can say the modern crowd is so indoctrinated, um, and also universally the kind of the subjects that we're dealing with in Buddhism goes beyond the ordinary superficial um, level of conversation and the things we you know sort of generally think and talk about, um, then they are difficult to be shared with a crowd. But they're not difficult to be shared with anybody who is questioning or reflecting. That's Stephen's point. So, um, so you know, you get your friends high on cappuccino, and you can probably have some some discussions about this. Yeah. Um, then there's a question here. Um, sorry for my kindergarten questions comments. No, please don't. Please never apologize for asking questions here. It's always really helpful for, for everybody. Okay, uh, but one thing I found difficult in my Dharma journey is being provided with information on what one should do and then having a gap on how one should go about doing it. This came up with the text, one is advised to learn the habits of precisely communicating. Okay, that's sound advice, but how? Well, that's a good question. <laughs> <laughs> That's not kindergarten at all. And that is actually a little bit lined up with the discussion before about the logic and debate, because that's where um, where actually we develop through logic questioning and so forth, um, we actually begin to develop a language of communicating. So, um, you know, the, the advice is good enough, you know, to learn the habits of precisely communicating. Um, uh, that's certainly valid advice. I mean, anybody who uh, t teaches or is in, in, in involved in imparting knowledge, sharing knowledge, will have to exercise the ability to meet the audience where they're coming from, you know? Otherwise, you go past each other. So it's, uh, it is a question of, um, of essentially um, developing language skills and that's also where this goes beyond just you know that we learn by heart sort of classical buddhist texts we actually need to develop our own vernacular in the context of communicating with our peers and our friends so um so yes so the question was um Someone, one thing I found difficult in my Dharma journey is being provided with information of what one should do and then having a gap on how one should go about doing it. This came up with the text, one is advised to learn the habits of precisely communicating. You know, when you get that, actually there's, I'd also like to 
celebrate this this um, this feeling of how oh, should I do that? Because when that sits and nags you, it haunts you. Then actually, it grips you. So if you're conscientious, then it grips you and it kind of says, "Yes, that's all very good," you know, to say communicate precisely, but exactly how. And you know, when this kind of thing sits and haunts you, it actually provides the fuel for developing one's own sort of experience of this. And then when you get, come back to a text or you look in other places, it actually all of a sudden it sticks because you're sitting there. It's as if you have sort of a um, Velcro surface. And when the sort of answer comes around, it really sticks. Whereas you didn't have it, if you didn't have that initial question, how? They're saying this, but how shall I do it? If you didn't have that, you wouldn't be like the Velcro waiting for the answer. You just, the, then the answers were sort of, there were, might be sort of, you know, skillful ways of that might actually elicit an understanding, might come by, but you know, it'll just sort of pass by. So when you have that kind of like, hmm, I want to find out, that's actually very good. Thank you for the answer. Most of the time I'm feeling quite clueless as to how to apply these things. Yeah, we all are. And you know, it's it's new material. So there's there's not necessarily places we can hang some of this on. But at the same time, um, hopefully the teaching provokes and touches on things that are really, uh, you could say incredibly relevant. And for, for when then the teaching is touching on something that's relevant for us and yet leaving some questions, then it's actually we begin to sort of um, be, be quite touched by the teachings. And then, you know, we're sitting with a question and then eventually the, the answers will come. You know, they will. Trust me, they will come. Anyway, keep asking questions and little by little, you know. Um, the problem of questioning or of the critical thinking is that you have no answers for your doubts. And so at certain point, you just have to be confident. Confident, is that not faith? Uh-uh. You have to find, I like to say, you must find answers. You must find answers for your doubts. Otherwise you don't have a path. And it's thanks to those doubts, it's thanks to asking those questions that you actually begin to have faith. Because when you have a question, which is about something deep and important, and you get the, and you have the doubt, then you're interested in the answer. And then when the answer comes, it clarifies. But you have to ask questions, you have to clarify. And if you don't get the answers, you have to push and find the answers. And that's why the Buddha said, you must never accept what I have said on the basis of respect or faith in my person, but you should do so on the basis of your own doubt and inquiry. Just like if you're going to buy gold, you first test, is it real gold? So that's why doubt is the gateway to faith. Without doubt, we won't have real faith. If you're just sort of saying, oh yeah, whatever they say, you know, it doesn't stick. You don't have the Velcro, you know? So you have to have doubt. <clears throat> and then when the answers, when, when the doubt has been answered, you have so much more, you know, real sort of uh, appreciation for this insight, yeah? Um, do the eight worldly concerns ever cause conflict on the eightfold path? Could this lead to logical debate? Uh, eight for eight, lo, the the uh, the eight worldly concerns. That's just that's uh, neurosis. So that's that's just that's part of the truth of of the cause of suffering. So so um, in terms of of the the, um, the four noble truths, then this is the eight worldly eight worldly concerns. They are uh, causes of suffering. And so uh, they're remedied with the with the path, with the with the um, with the path, yeah, the eightfold path. I have noticed that deep down, I don't really believe in reincarnation. Of course, you know, where did we ever learn in that, right? Where does one start 
in regards to testing the perspective of reincarnation. Is debate and logic the only way to understand it? Not really. It's observing the nature of consciousness and then the nature of that which is not consciousness. Of course, for example, within the medical profession, the assumption is that your brain gives rise to consciousness. But that is a very, that's an assumption and a belief that stands on very shaky grounds. So if you look at neuroscience, they will say, and they will acknowledge that consciousness is not really understood. The general audience, they will say, oh yeah, yeah of course, you know, and 99% of, you could say, doctors, scientists and so forth will say, oh yeah, of course, consciousness originates in the brain. And when the brain is dead, then that's it. But if we look at, at the, the foundations for this, it's actually something that's very questionable. And within neuroscience, there is a very, very prevalent and humble recognition that we don't really know what consciousness is and to, to believe, and that's where the Buddhists would say, to believe that consciousness arises out of something that doesn't have consciousness. Essentially, there's an explanatory gap. We understand that they're neurobiological systems, but how consciousness would come out of that that's that's a leap of faith. So that's where the the sort of the proof of reincarnation doesn't just believe with with saying, oh yeah, we want to believe in reincarnation. It actually begins with beginning to doubt the what we call the materialist position. And then of course you can substantiate it with with um you can substantiate it with all the sort of the testimonies about people who could remember previous lives. I'll, I'll put up, I'm going to make a folder. Um, you all have the link for the, the, uh, for the reading folder. And I'm going to put up a, um, a, something. It's from a book by Matthew Ricard and a, a Vietnamese um, scientist. And it's called The Quantum and the Lotus. And in there, there's, um, there's a chapter by Matthew, which is called The Virtual Frontier. And in there, he actually, he sort of uh, expands a bit about what I was just saying here. So you'll find that interesting. Okay. Doubt is the gateway to faith. Sounds like a paradox, doesn't it? Yes, it does. Yeah. But the thing is, critical thinking enables us to actually appreciate something, you know? So when we begin to think critically about something and we begin to trust something, then we have a very, so it's it sounds like a, Paradox, but in terms of our experience in life, it's it's not a paradox. What is the difference between devotion, which is very much appreciated, and faith? Well, you could say devotion, first of all, faith is a really great thing, but the problem is blind faith. So, so when we have faith in somebody or something, it's something that really takes us beyond our ordinary rationality. Now, devotion is the key that takes us to that place because devotion comes with a recognition of this I could do. There's sort of this respect and inspiration, but there's also a, a sense that I need to, there's something greater. And so that's where it takes us into a greater dimension. You know, very often we operate within a very pedestrian, like this is what there is in this world. Devotion, however, begins is the sort of the, the quality of appreciating something that's greater and also that our heart beats for it. You know, there's some sense of connection. And that's when, when, we, when we begin to um, have that, then it takes us into a greater place, which is faith. But we need to begin with just wanting to have faith right away is a bit too easy. We have to first think critically. Um, isn't an answer also a kind of concept? Oh yeah, but we we are we are we are conceptual creatures. So you know we have concepts like time and space. What's for dinner? And uh, like Tsongsi Kinzerimba just says, you know, try and go without lunch, and you will find out that we're very attached to our concepts. Since the time Sansa Jenkins mentioned that even reincarnation is a relative truth, a Cinderella story, I have an idea about it as loosely held and somewhat not so fixed about it. But then karma comes into the picture, cause and effect. Well, everything that's relative is a Cinderella story. Um, COVID-19 is a Cinderella story. New York City is a Cinderella story. Um, 
the uh, the president of the United States is a Cinderella story, etc. Everything that's com that's con confined within relative truth is Cinderella truth, but we still operate within it. So if we're going to go from A to B, we need to travel a particular place, and so we're still very much within the Cinderella story. Um, so really beautiful when you see people answer their own questions through the process of inquiry and questioning. Yes, that also happens, you know, when we have one of these haunting sort of questions that we look for questions, but then sometimes also they, they we, we ourselves um, find the answer. Gosh, we're going way over time here. <laughs> Um, often, okay, I'm going to have to, oh my God, okay, so, so, uh, okay, no more questions, we'll save them for next time, okay, okay, I'm, I'm going <laughs> to stop here, <laughs> often we seeing the Buddhists, especially Chinese, I'm sorry to mention, simply worship so-called <laughs> Buddhism for their own benefits, like they and their family. Then their families. <laughs> so um, yeah, we see we see them simply worshiping so-called Buddhism for their own benefits, like then their family's health or wealth. And often we're seeing them break their knees in front of Buddha statues. How to encourage them to learn the real Buddha teaching? Cannot say they are doing wrong, but. It is wrong in Buddha's teachings, right? Look, there's so many different ways. And so for, for many people, then the, the teaching of the Buddha uh, represents something greater, but it's seen as something out there. And so it's inevitable that you have that. So, you know, it's, it's more important, I think, that we really engage in the Buddhist teachings. And, you know, if we can inspire others, that's good. But other than that, we also, you know, we, we need need to just let people do what they how they interpret it, you know. Can you suggest any readings on Buddhist logic and debate if there's anything like that? Yeah, there is. Um, oh, there is. Uh, let me think about that. Okay, there is some for sure. Actually, there's a lot, you know. I mean, gosh, I remember there was what's his name. Daniel Perdue, who wrote a book called Debate, an enormous brick of a book I had. And uh, there's also Knowing, Naming and Negation by uh, Anne Carolyn Klein. Uh, there's a lot of books on debate and so forth, yeah. But we also actually within the tradition of meditation, we also so we warn a little bit about that because it could become sort of a whole you know, obsession. There's a fab video on doubt and belief in green tomato chili, green tomato red chili teaching Berlin on this. Okay. Uh, when I used to pose, when I used to pose the question. Okay. Uh, okay. I think Dr. Eden Stevenson's, that's right. Dr. Eden Stevenson's work is quite interesting to shake a bit the materialistic view study about children who claim to have past life memories. Yes, so even Stevenson's from, from uh, the University of Virginia has done something like 1,200 cases uh, of children who remembered past lives. But at the same time, also, um, uh, it's to, to, yeah, so that that could be understood as empirical evidence. At the same time, it's not widely accepted. And that's why the, there's two ways of going about it. One is sort of these kind of assertive approaches about, you know, that this, these people remember their past lives, obviously. But there's also the, the you could say, deconstructive aspect, which is really uh, very helpful. And that's more the middle way approach to actually doubt. You could say the Cinderella, the Seren Cinderella, uh, story about consciousness as something that is uh, that's that has an existence that is something that is that is shaped by particular causes and then comes to an end, and that's why 
Well, it's so important that we understand the nature of consciousness is something that is entirely intangible and doesn't really operate on the basis of materialist uh, material uh, components. So the so the logic that's behind um, the, the the science really that informs reincarnation um, very much exposes the, the the flaw that there is no you could say cause and effect relationship between um, material causes and then immaterial consciousness. Um, when I used to pose questions about how to apply the teaching, the answer I was given was follow the instruction. See, that's really, that's very low grade um, answer because that's not informing you in the view. That's what you, that actually is, the, the, usually has the opposite effect and you lose faith. So it's very important when people ask questions, you don't just say, oh yeah, just meditate and everything will become fine. You actually need to meet with respect the question and actually answer it. And so that's where, you know, you can't just tell people, oh, you don't have enough faith, you don't have enough devotion and so on, you know. Um, but um, of course that happens, you know. Yeah, yeah. Um, okay, next time we're... Well, I'm going to have to close at, at this. <laughs> any questions that are posed after um, 5.55, we'll have to wait till next time, okay? You can just try to remember them and answer them, I ask them next time. But anyway, for today, okay? Next time, no questions after 5 to 6 next, next Monday, okay? Um, so, so I stopped posing questions. No, no, that's not the Buddhist way. The, the Buddhist way is to ask questions. Um, at least until a certain point, there is a place where you realize the flaw of the rational linear mind. But at the same time, um, that, that's a little bit advanced actually. And so initially to really develop faith, you have to ask questions. Uh, in other words, is Cinderella's story the cause and effect story? Yes, yes. Cinderella's story is exactly that, that we believe in an existence on the basis of cause and effect. Uh, this was inciting such an interesting discussion, yes. Uh, why, do we, why do we want to look for answers if concepts have to be overcome? Because concepts give us faith. And so without faith, it's difficult to practice the path. And of course, the path will enable us to go beyond duality, beyond concepts and so forth. But to actually be willing to go through that process, we have to have an understanding of the science of why we're doing this. Without that, we actually, we might be inspired one day and to sort of practice the path and go beyond concepts. But then another day, we don't really do it. This is the honest truth, isn't it? We might feel sort of that we can exist without concepts one day, but then, you know, other days we're completely caught up in our concepts. So it's very important that we have this, what we call Vajra intelligence, this hard foundation of, of solid understanding. So then we don't, we don't sort of have back and forth about um, practicing or not practicing, you know, then we really know ex exactly what we're doing. It's like if, if um, you know, if your car isn't working, well, you need you need to do something about it. it. Doesn't you know? It doesn't help that that you don't feel like doing it. You just need to do it. So likewise, also, when we are practicing and we need to go beyond concepts, we actually need to know exactly why we're doing it. So we need to first have this foundation of the view, and then on the path, yes, then we can go beyond concepts. Okay, Tibetan logic by Catherine Manchester Rogers is also on logic, but it's heady. Okay. Yeah. Um, really appreciate the sharing of Dharma. Much to contemplate. Is there going to be practice time after the study? Oh yes, that we we will. I think today the the sort of the uh, the discussion around meditation will be quite quite uh, short. And see, actually about the question about going beyond concepts, that is what we do when we, when we practice meditation. But what we're doing right now with study is actually really inform ourselves. Why are we, why are we engaging in the path? Why are we uh, meditating? So of course, the, 
the remedy. Yes, it is to go beyond concepts, um, but it is also informed by an understanding of how the ordinary world operates with the concepts, with duality, with what we call relative truth. And so that's where we can understand what are the conditions for suffering, what are the conditions for freedom. And um, this informs us. So this is just like if you're going to be following a course of, uh, let's say you're, you're beginning to uh, follow a course of some treatment, you know, um, a, a medical treatment. You want to actually, you want to first understand, is this course of remedy? Can I trust the doctor? Can I trust his methods or her methods? Is, it, is this something that works? And that's where, that's where it's so important that we initially question, because once we can see, ah, this, 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 is, this method actually is really good, then we can follow it, then we don't need to question all the time. Thank you. Gracias. <laughs> okay, I think we're gonna conclude here, and um, then we'll, Talk a little bit about meditation very briefly and then we'll do some practice. Okay. Did I have the. Uh, hold on. The Dharma class. Dedication. Okay. By this merit, may all attain omniscience. May it defeat the enemy wrongdoing. From the stormy waves of birth, old age, sickness and death, from the ocean of samsara, may all beings be freed. May bodhicitta, precious and sublime, arise where it has not yet come to be, and where it has arisen, may it never fail, but grow and flourish ever more and more. So, we'll have one minute break, if you just need to to step aside and um, then I'll just say a very few words on meditation and then we'll do the the um, the Buddha practice and meditation okay So by the way, um, you're looking at the view from a place in Eastern Tibet called Katok. And Katok was built in the, I think, 11th century. It's one of the oldest um, monastic institutions in Tibet. And uh, when Buddhism was persecuted in, uh, in central Tibet after the collapse of the Tibetan Empire, um, there was it was some monastics that escaped that managed that then established um, the tradition from where Katak originates. So this is very early Buddhism in Tibet. What you see here is the restored, what's called the Sangrupari uh, temple at Katak, but it's up in the hills. It's uh, it's a steep steep uh, path going up there. I think there's a there's a 
you can you can drive up there now but uh, it's quite a climb and um katok was was also known as katok uh, the buddhaya the or the actually vatrasana the uh, <clears throat> the diamond seat of katok many many great sages emerged from this place okay just a little bit about uh, the practice of meditation which is that without meditation practice everything that we're doing in terms of study just gets left as ideas so as we've been discussing yes we're going beyond concepts but then again we need to know where we're going so that is why study is very helpful on the other hand study without practicing uh, is is um, is not that helpful it, it basically it can create a lot of faith and the good thing about buddhism is that it is it welcomes critical thinking so you could end up with a lot of faith in the teaching <laughs> which is great but also there has to be a place where we begin to experience what we're talking about in the teaching and that is the um, constructed um, elusive illusory nature of our mind and the flaw that lies in us fixating getting stuck on our thoughts our mind our confusion and that's where despite what meditation looks like it's actually getting out of our heads it's getting out of our ordinary fixation and that's not easy we are habitually inclined to spiral inward and fixate on our thoughts and so forth and to actually uh, go beyond to actually sit and be present without our normal entanglement is not that easy that's why meditation is something that requires perseverance because it goes a little bit against our habitual restless itch and that's that's why we we uh, we don't assume that meditation necessarily is that easy we would say meditation is essential we must meditate but it's also something that uh, requires that we inform ourselves and we understand what we're doing and that's where again study can be very helpful in terms that it it galvanizes or it sort of mobilizes brings about uh, a determination to pursue this so so often when we're practitioners we'll be very inspired by all sorts of little inspirational quotes or um, things that actually point to 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 um, that which is uh, beyond our ordinary habits so with the practice of meditation we become very sensitized to the validity of enlightenment and that's of course why you have something like the katak monastery here you know why would people construct all this you know if you look at that a lot of gold a lot of effort and so on because it's something that that points to that which is beyond the ordinary and um there's so many different ways of doing that and so to um to uh bring home this this uh, this perspective there's so many different ways but anyway what we're what we're doing here then uh, with the practice of meditation is invoking the the presence of the buddha again because that's something that on one hand we would say the buddha is out there but at the other hand the buddha is actually out there as a mirror that sh that essentially embodies what we naturally possess inside so we initially operate with the reference point of the deity or the buddha or the enlightened uh, as you could say the sacred embodiment of uh, enlightenment as external but then we also dissolve the reference point and that's what we're doing then with the the um, the practice that we do here in the buddha sadhana as far as meditation itself goes when we are relinquishing reference uh, reference point of the buddha um, we essentially are connecting with the open di dimension of where we are we're connecting with our reality and we don't actually need to be looking for something but what we're particularly uh, how we actually uh, practice meditation is that we practice not getting entangled in our thoughts so we have the posture and we have the focusing on our breath in the case of the buddha we have the focus of the buddha but then again without the focus of the buddha we can focus on our breath uh, 
If you're comfortable, then sure, remain without any reference point. But sometimes when we when we practice without reference point, we just end up thinking a lot about what that actually means. And so we don't really go beyond concepts at all. And that's why it's quite helpful to have a very simple, non-conceptual reference point, which is then coming back to the breath. So there, many of you have the instructions to particularly focus on the out-breath. And in doing so, as thoughts arise, allow thoughts to arise, but don't necessarily get carried away by the thoughts. And that's where it's helpful to then just come back to the breath. There's a lot to be said about meditation, and um, <clears throat> I think many of you already have received a lot of instruction on meditation. So anyway, if you've never come across instruction on meditation before, um, there's a lot out there. I always warmly recommend the works by Chugyam Trungpa, who is very, very skillful in presenting meditation in a modern context. And also, usually, we have here in the Monday study and practice program, there's usually a component from 6 to 6.30 where I explain a little bit about meditation. Meanwhile, today we're just going to start, go straight to the, to the practice then. Just in the treasure of blessings, yeah. This, by the way, this, this sadhana, this short, it's not even really a sadhana. You know, we refer to it as the Buddha sadhana, but it's it's actually a practice what we call Sanjya Jesudremba or Buddha Anusmiti. Uh, this practice you can do in conjunction with the Bhumi Sparsha that Tsongsi Kanzarimbaji has been talking about. So you can do this in its in its uh, in its entirety, which is really just there's five minutes up until the mantra, and uh, you can use that then. And otherwise, you can also just chant a short invocation that comes just before the, the mantra, the Dharani, and use that uh, in conjunction with the Bhumi Sparsha um, accumulation. I think also we're going to start doing this on, 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 uh, in the mornings at 7.30. You know, there's a, there's a there's a meditation session in the morning from 7 to 7.30, roughly. And we're, we're going to, in addition to that, then from 7.30 onwards, we'll do, uh, I think, something like this with within the a period of um, accumulating the, the, the Buddha mantra. Okay. So we'll begin. In the jewels of the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Sangha, we take refuge until we attain enlightenment. By the merit of practicing generosity and the like, may we attain Buddhahood for the benefit of beings. In the jewels of the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Sangha, we take refuge until we attain enlightenment. By the merit of practicing generosity and the like, may we attain Buddhahood for the benefit of beings. In the jewels of the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Sangha, we take refuge until we attain enlightenment. By the merit of practicing generosity and the like, May we attain Buddhahood for the benefit of beings. May all beings come to possess happiness and the cause of happiness. May they come to be free from suffering and the cause of suffering. May they never separate from the happiness which is without suffering. May they come to rest in the boundless equanimity which is free from both attachment to loved ones and hatred for others. Ah, as a magical display, the union of the unborn emptiness and the unceasing manifestation of interdependent origination, visualized in front of one in the sky, infinite clouds of offerings, in the middle of which, upon a jeweled lion throne, lotus, sun, and moon, is the incomparable teacher, the lion of the shakas, the color of gold endowed with the major and minor marks, wearing the three dharma robes and seated in vajra posture. His right hand is stretched out in the gesture of touching the earth, his left hand in the mudra of equanimity holds an arms bowl filled with nectar. He shines in splendor and majesty like a golden mountain, his wisdom filling space with the plexus of rays of light. 
He is surrounded by infinite retinues, hosts of exalted beings, the eight close sons, the sixteen Staviros, and others. On those who so much as think of him, he bestows complete liberation from the two extremes of samsara and nirvana, the glory of supreme bliss. Visualize him as the great being who embodies all the objects of refuge. Out of, com out of great compassion, you took care of this world of degeneration and strife and made 500 great prayers of aspiration. You're praised as a white lotus. Whoever hears your name will not return to samsara. Compassionate teacher, I submit obeisance to you. The wealth and accumulation of merit of body, speech, and mind of myself and others, I offer, visualizing them as a Samantabhadra cloud of offerings. All the negative actions and downfalls that have accumulated since beginning this time without exception, I confess each one with strong, heartfelt regret. I rejoice at the merit accumulated in the past, present, and future by the exalted beings and by ordinary beings. The wheel of Dharma of the profound and vast teachings I request you to turn uninterruptedly in the ten directions. Although your wisdom body, like the sky, remains without changing throughout the three times, according to the perception of beings you demonstrate birth and death, yet may you remain, may, may you appear in the Nirmanakaya form forever. Through the merits I accumulate in the past, present, and future, in order to benefit all beings throughout all space, may I constantly gladden the King of Dharma and attain the level of the conqueror, Lord of Dharma. Through your kindness, compassionately caring, especially for us unprotected beings of the degenerate age, whatever appearance there is of the three jewels in this world at this time is your enlightened activity. You are the only incomparable and sublime refuge. As I pray to you from my heart with total confidence, do not forget the great promise you made in the past. Care for us with compassion until we attain enlightenment. Guru, teacher, Bhagavad, Tathagata, Arahat, perfect Buddha, glorious conqueror, Chakyamuni, I submit obeisance to you. I make offerings. I take refuge. Guru, teacher, Bhagavad, Tathagata, Arhat, perfect Buddha, glorious conqueror, Shakyamuni, I submit obeisance to you, I make offerings, I take refuge. Guru, teacher, Bhagavad, Tathagata, Arhat, perfect Buddha, glorious conqueror, Shakyamuni, I submit obeisance to you, I make offerings, I take refuge. Te yata o muni muni maha munaya soha. 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 Oh Muni Muni Mahamuna is so ha. Oh Muni Muni Mahamuna is so ha. Oh Muni Muni Mahamuna is so ha. Oh Muni Muni Mahamuna is so many 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 Muni Mahamuna.
Omani Mani Mahamunaya Soha. From the body of the Buddha shines a great light, a multicolored rays of wisdom light, dispelling all the obscurations of myself and all beings, perfecting the qualities of the Mahayana path, and establishing us on the level of non returner. So, at this point, we'll sit for 15 minutes. And um, I'll put the image of a great meditator to go on.
<clears throat> the miraculous display of the unsurpassable wisdom appears as the intentions, deeds, prayers, knowledge, love, and ability of all the Sugatas and their sons. May all beings become exactly like them. And then the aspiration prayer of Maitreya. I prostrate to all the Buddhas and to the Bodhisattvas endowed with the divine eye of the sages and to the Shravakas as well. I prostrate to Bodhicitta, which counteracts birth in all lower realms, perfectly shows the path to the higher realms and leads to no aging nor death. Whatever negative actions I have done under the influence of an afflicted mind in the presence of the Buddhas, I fully acknowledge them all. By the accumulation of any merit I have created through the three kinds of activities, may my seed of omniscience grow and may I attain awakening that never ends. Whatever offerings to the Buddhas that can be found in realms of the ten directions are known to the Buddhas who rejoice in them. I rejoice in all these offerings. I fully acknowledge all negative actions and rejoice in all merit. I prostrate to all the Buddhas. May I attain supreme primordial wisdom. I earnestly request the Bodhisattvas who reside on the ten levels in all the direction of the world and the ten directions to awaken into supreme enlightenment. Once you have awakened into genuine enlightenment and tamed the Maras and their horns, may you turn the wheel of Dharma so that all living beings may be healed. With the sound of the great Dharma drum, may you free all sentient beings who are suffering. Throughout inconceivable millions of kalpas, may you remain and teach the Dharma. Mired in the swamp of desire, entangled in the strands of cyclic existence, I am fettered by all that binds. I supplicate those supreme among humans to look upon me. The Buddhas do not blame sentient beings who are flawed. With a loving heart for all sentient beings, may the Buddhas free them from the ocean of cyclic existence. Any perfect Buddhas who are present, those who have passed away and those yet to come, May I train following in their way and engage in enlightened conduct. Having perfected the six parameters, may I liberate the six families of sentient beings. Having actualized the six extraordinary faculties, may I reach unexcelled enlightenment. Future phenomena are not born and those past will not occur. Present phenomena have no inherent nature. There is no actual location. There is no perception. There are no outer things. May I realize the Dhamma Dhatu of emptiness. According to the Buddhas, the great sages, there are no truly existent sentient beings, no life force. There is no truly existent individual and no nurturing of a self. May I realize the Dhamma Ta where the self is not present. An entity such as grasping onto a self and mind is not present within any of the parameters. To benefit all sentient beings, may I give with generosity free of avarice. Since things do not exist as entities, may my wealth appear spontaneously. Since all things totally disintegrate, may I perfect the parameter of generosity. Endowed with the flawless ethics that is guided by rules and an ethics that is completely pure, with an ethics free of an arrogant mind, may I perfect the parameter of ethics. Just as the elements of earth, water, fire, and wind, bodhisattvas do not remain con caught by mental constructs. By attaining patience, anger never arises. May I perfect the parameter of patience. Through the power of previous perseverance, having become stable, enthusiastic, and free of laziness, and through a strong body and mind, may I perfect the parameter of perseverance. Through the samadhi where all is illusion-like, through the samadhi of the hero's stride, and through the samadhi that is like a bhadra, May I perfect the parameter of meditative concentration. Through actualizing the three gates of full liberation, the equal nature of the three times, and the three types of knowing as well, may I perfect the parameter of prajna. Through persevering in a bodhisattva's practice, may I attain the kaya praised by all the Buddhas, the luminous kaya and the kaya blazing with majesty. Thus, may my intention be fulfilled. May I be like the famous Maitreya who engaged in such a practice, perfected the parameters, and perfectly abides at the zenith of the tenth level. By this merit, may all attain omniscience, may it defeat the enemy wrongdoing, from the stormy waves of birth, old age, sickness, and death, from the ocean of samsara, may all beings be freed. May bodhicitta, precious and sublime, arise where it has not yet come to be, and where it has arisen, may it never fail, but grow and flourish ever more and more. May the Buddha appear in this world. May the light of the teaching shine like the sun. May the holders of the teaching live in harmony, and thus may all be auspicious for the teaching to endure. We pray for the good health of the teachers. We pray for their precious lives to be long. We pray for their activities to spread and increase. May we be blessed never to part from the teachers. 
Akashasya stitiyava yavacha jagataha stiti tavan mama stiti buyan jagadukan inignata akasyasya stiti yavat yavacha jagataha stiti Tavan Vamas Diti Buyahan Jagadukani Nignata Tavan Vamas Diti Buyahan Jagadukani Nignata Tavan Vamas Diti Buyahan Jagadukani Nignata as long as space remains, as long as the world remains, may I too remain to alleviate the sufferings of the world. All right. There's some, uh, there's a couple of questions. Uh, somebody asked, what's the name of the sadhana we are currently practicing? Thank you. It's called the Treasure of Blessings, and uh, it's up in the resource folder. You'll find it up there. And uh, yes, I'll share this document in the Dropbox. If it's not there already, I thought I think it might be there. Can you please read the name of the practitioner in the picture? Slowly, please. Yes, I'm terrible when it comes to Tibetan. We... <laughs> Tulku Ujjan. Tulku Ujjan Rinpoche. So he was a very great master, uh, master of masters. And um, you will find a lot about Tugurjan Rinpoche. He was, he was um, a holder of some of the most important teachings and particularly he was renowned as a master of Dzogchen. So this picture was actually taken by um, Eric Schmidt. And um, I think Eric asked him, Rinpoche, can you show us how to just remain in the natural state? And Rinpoche, Tuguja Rinpoche then said, you mean like this? And then Eric took the picture. That's, that's what I had heard. Yeah. Okay. See you later. And um, I'll put this liturgy up there. And there was something else I was going to put up there as well. Oh, yes, I'm going to put that piece um, by Matthew Ricard, which uh, talks about um, yeah, reincarnation, rebirth. Quantum of the Lotus, exactly. Okay. Hola. See you.